Good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us at this, the final moments of the, the 2021 Holyrood election campaign. It's polling day tomorrow, finally. We've been working towards this for so long, uh, and now suddenly it's upon us. Uh, I think we've run a really energetic campaign. We've certainly tried to bring new energy into the, the campaign uh, on issues which uh, very often are getting ignored. Yesterday on TV, I was asked about the royal yacht of all things in the middle of a climate emergency. Uh, it is sometimes frustrating getting these these issues across when others don't want to talk about them, but I think we've done incredibly well. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been part of the campaign and who's been helping us in the streets, on social media, uh, or just you know putting up a window poster uh, and going out to vote tomorrow. Lorna, this has been a pretty incredible period for you as well, because we've been the first co-leadership team in the in the party uh, for the best part of two years now. This has been your first chance to front up uh, a big election campaign. It must have been an extraordinary experience for you, and I think you've you've done incredibly well. You've impressed loads of people with the the energy that you brought to the campaign. How how have you found it? Uh, well, th thanks very much for for, be, for your kind words. I mean, it's been massively overwhelming for me. Ob obviously, it's been a real comfort to be able to work with yourself and you know do debate practice with you and see see you getting to do your you know getting to show your debating skills and, and learning from you. And we have, of course, a really experienced press team who have been super supportive of me um, with practicing and making sure I, I have good briefings and I know what I'm supposed to be doing. But there is that sort of terrifying moment when it's just you in the lens of the camera, and you're trying to remember what to say. And I, I do suffer from really bad stage fright. So I sort of seem like, feel like I'm spending my life in a haze of anxiety at the moment. But uh, um, it, has been, it, it has been a sort of learning, learning on the job kind of experience. But I, I think you're right. I think we have managed to, as a team, you know, the, the sort of green campaign team and all of our candidates, Get a bit of a buzz going wherever i go people are excited they recognize me they ask for selfies they say oh i love that patrick or oh i love that carolyn scrimgeour or, like they know who our candidates are i had a taxi driver tell me how great he thought ross greer was you know like <laughs> they they know who our candidates are we've created such a buzz um so as exhausted as i know we all are and our volunteers and our staff are and i feel like i'm kind of crawling over the finish line it's really quite exhilarating I, like it's going well. <laughs> <laughs> and it really does offer us the, the chance to take green politics to the next level in Scotland. Uh, opinion polls are only opinion polls, uh, and nobody, even at this late stage, is taking anything for granted. Most of them show that we've got the potential to, to grow significantly uh, our number of MSPs. That's only going to happen if people actually get out the door tomorrow and put that X uh, on that piece of paper uh, in some it. parts of the country on both pieces of paper. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? So the big thing now is to get the vote out tomorrow. Knock, knock on your neighbor's doors, pester your friends, get everybody out tomorrow to vote because as well as the campaign has gone, as much excitement has been, has been generated, as much optimism, unless we get those X's on the paper, it's just not going to count. But say it does go well tomorrow, Patrick, and we do get everyone out and there's a good turnout at the election tomorrow, and we do get a bigger green MSP group in the parliament. I mean, you're a very experienced parliamentarian. You've worked um, in a you know a smaller group and then last term in a larger group, in an even larger group. What does that look like? What are we going to be able to do in parliament? Well, yeah, I mean, I've had two sessions where we've had six or seven MSPs, and I've had two sessions where we were just two of us. Uh, and uh, I mean, that the difference between between those results was extraordinary. The ability to have uh, more capacity, more ability to get involved in the wide range of issues. And green politics is so often about the big picture. Uh, it's not just about, you know, here's here's one issue in isolation. It's about how they connect together. So having the ability to get involved in, in that wider range of, of issues and having the capacity to, to go deep into some of the issues that the parliament's debating uh, makes a, a huge difference. And you know, one of the things that's really exciting about this election, it could be, it might just be the first time when we represent everybody in Scotland. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's um, only a couple of regions where we uh, don't have a, an MSP at the moment. There's only one region where we've never yet 
gained an MSP uh, and that's Central Scotland. And most of the polls, we were only a whisker away last time, most of the polls are suggesting that we can do that this time uh, if folk in Central Scotland get out there and vote for the awesome Gillian Mackay, who's our, who's our lead candidate there. That would be so exciting. So among the things that I'm particularly excited about is that all of our incoming new MSPs, presuming, presuming everyone gets out and votes tomorrow, are, are women and they're such a talented bunch. So Gillian Mackay in Central Scotland has been campaigning uh, around fair pay for carers this week, which is something that we you know, feel really strongly about. There cannot, there cannot be climate justice without social justice and caring work is so undervalued in our society. I know you were talking about it this week in one of your debates, I think, Patrick. Yeah, it came up in the in the final BBC debate. And, um, you know, I think all the political parties are recognising we need to do a lot better. In the in the last session, the, the Greens were successful in persuading the, the Scottish government to introduce uh, a young carers allowance. But the 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 carers grants and allowances that exist for, for unpaid carers uh, are still really inadequate. And there are there are kind of more detailed problems with it as well. Like it, it doesn't recognize uh, the particular needs of somebody who, who cares for more than one person. Uh, and um, yeah, so there's, there's many different areas where that needs to be improved. It's the amount of money, but it's also a lot of the detail about how it impacts on, on people's lives. And I think all the political parties recognize that there's real movement is needed on this. So I'm I'm actually really hopeful that there's going to be uh, a strong chance of, of getting change uh, on this, uh, almost regardless of the of the result. But Greens will will certainly be uh, banging the drum enthusiastically for for you know progress for, for unpaid carers, but also for the national care service that we need to take the profit motive out of social care, uh, and also to take the poverty pay out of social care. Care work should not be a rock bottom poverty paid job. It should be something that we value highly because it's critical to all of our well-being. I think there's one of the things that I think is almost unique to the Greens, but certainly what we bring to politics is a really joined up set of thinking. You can't separate poverty pay from poverty and you cannot separate poverty from things like the longevity gap, from gaps, educational attainment gaps, from you know, gaps in nutrition and other you know achievement and integration in society you can't separate these things out they're all connected up and so i think the yeah. Brit greens really bring joined up thinking to that you, you can't tackle any of these problems in isolation you certainly can't tackle the environment in isolation it's not and i think other parties tend to try and put it in the box and go oh, well, well we'll deal with the environment it's over there but no it's it's everything every single bit of it is joined up and you have to think about the environment and social justice and fairness in every single decision you make. Uh, it has to be part of that process. And a big thing that I would like to look at is, and I would like, you know, I think all the Greens, you know, are interested in this too, is looking at our planning frameworks, our how we make decisions, not just the decisions we make, but how we make them so that we can move toward this well-being economy. And as you say, take the profit motive out of it. Let's, let's make sure we're building things to last, things that actually benefit us and that we can then hand on and one of the things i think that's exciting about the national care service is the idea that it's a legacy that we can pass on our grandparents handed us the nhs what a wonderful legacy to come out of something as awful as the second world war than to hand to us let us create something wonderful out of the awfulness that has been the pandemic to hand to our grandkids yeah and that that thing about how decisions are made is really important you know the the idea that people who are affected by policy should have their voices heard uh, when policy is made. So, you know, carers and people who receive care, whether unpaid care or, or paid social care, should have a voice in shaping what that national care service is like. Disabled people, for example, I know a lot of disabled organizations are really concerned that the, the design of a national care service might happen without their voices being heard. And that would inevitably just mean that you get the wrong result. And um, you know there, there are other areas where that's really important. I know uh, Kim and Nadia, uh, my my colleagues in Glasgow, the next two uh, lead uh, lead candidates in Glasgow, they've been working particularly on issues like uh, uh, rights for uh, refugees and asylum seekers, uh, as well as uh, trans healthcare, healthcare for, for transgender people. And again, these are issues where decisions are often made 
for people or about people, but not with the people that are being affected. And how exciting is it in this election tomorrow, refugees in Scotland can vote that we've expanded to expand the franchise so that every person in Scotland, 16 or over, who's registered to vote can vote. Um, it doesn't depend on your citizenship. It doesn't depend on, on you know, any of those kind of old barriers that we used to put in front of voting, um, which just seems crazy to me. How wonderful to be able to welcome people to Scotland um, and say, you're welcome. You're part of our community. Join us in the decision-making process. You get to help decide who's going to make these decisions. Um, there was a really touching video on Twitter this this week or of, of some refugees saying, you know, how wonderful it is to get to vote. And a friend of mine who's um, originally from Japan, who lived here for 21 years, and this is the first time she'll be able to vote. Wow. What a thing. It's just brilliant. No, I, I saw an exchange on, uh, on social media uh, last week, I think it was, about you know, how that came about and uh, whether everybody voted for that in, in Parliament. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the Tories were the only party in the end that voted against extending the franchise. Uh, it was it was Ross, uh, I think, who first made the case, Ross Greer, who first made the case, and we worked really hard. But in, in the end, most of the political parties agreed. And I had to go back and, and look at the official report from that debate, and I'd forgotten just how appalling the Tories were on it. They, they actually said very clearly and explicitly in terms uh, that, you know, the, 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 the whole reason they were voting against the bill uh, was that it empowered foreign people to vote uh, and that 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 was just a, a fundamental principle that they couldn't accept. Um, and, you know, we see the, the result of, of that kind of situation where people don't have a voice and where decisions are made about them. Uh, you get the result of of an asylum process which treats people as subhuman, really. It doesn't recognise their basic human dignity. Uh, and we can do so much better for the, the most vulnerable people in our society uh, than the, the systems that are currently in place from the, what I would say is an institutionally racist home office. I agree. It, it, it seems to be a bit of a theme as well. So you, you mentioned that Kim has been campaigning for trans health care, for improved trans health care. And that it seems to be another si situation where humans are treated in an inhumane manner, having to wait, you know, years, three up to three years, I think maybe more for life saving health care is, is an inhumane way to treat people. It's not treating our fellow human beings with dignity. Yeah. Something that um, a lot of reporters have asked me about in the last couple of weeks, which I get a little, a little bit tired of, I don't know, maybe you do as well, is about foreign travel and when, when, no, when can we get back in planes and how are we going to save the aviation industry and all yeah. this sort of stuff. Um, Can't which, we book um, our holidays yet? Can't we book um, our holidays yet? <laughs> So I know our colleague Ariane uh, in, in the Highlands and Islands has been working to halt the expansion of the Inverness Airport. And I, I wanted to kind of talk about that that doesn't mean we're against people going on a holiday, you know, because one of our most popular policies has in fact been uh, to reinstate the ferry between Recife and Europe so that we can take holidays to Europe, but we don't have to do it. We don't have to fly. We shouldn't be flying yeah. internally anyway. We should have reliable, inexpensive railways that get us wherever we need to go inside the UK on the island of. And we should have reliable, affordable ferries to get us in a low carbon way to Europe. Yeah. No, I mean, there's there's obviously a need for lifeline flights to the to the islands, for example. Uh, but the capacity is already there for that. You, you don't need to expand uh, airport capacity to do that. And if you expand the capacity, you'll just increase demand for those longer haul flights, uh, which which you know aren't necessary. And in particular, demand for uh, you know flights uh, within mainland uh, UK or mainland GB, which can be done by by rail. Uh, and that's what we've seen. You know, every time governments say, "Well, we we want to have a sustainable aviation policy, but you know we also need to support flight growth," and and let's let's do it responsibly. All it does is fuel growth in the most unnecessary uh, aspects of aviation. And, you know, 70% of the flights uh, are not ordinary families taking a, an occasional holiday. They're the richest 15% of the population flying routinely, treating aviation as casually as getting on a bus. Uh, and that's, that's where the growth has been in recent years. And that's really what the, the frequent flyer levy would, would help to, to suppress is unnecessary 
uh, aviation that's that's really only benefiting the wealthiest. Most most households in in Scotland don't take a flight in an average year. I'm talking pre-COVID. Mm. Uh, it's uh, it's the tiny minority who fly all the time uh, that are that are fueling the the growth of unsustainable aviation. But it drives me crazy that so much taxpayer subsidy and tax breaks are given to the aviation industry. The fact that it's cheaper to fly to London than it is to take the train isn't an accident. It's not the result of market forces. It is absolutely the result of government decisions and government subsidy. And yeah. it does seem mad that we are levying taxes to pay to uh, when we when we don't levy taxes on the fuel. If you see what I mean. So we're we're charging the passengers instead of the business. Well, just stop, stop. Stop giving them the tax breaks in the first place. We wouldn't have to try and make up the revenue elsewhere. It just, oh, it drives me crazy. I think you retweeted something from the Financial Times just now, which was showing how pandemic recovery payments were being given out to highly polluting industries. Tax well, yeah. money, just going, the, going to the, the people G20. who are causing the problem that we're going to have to clean up later. Yeah, it was a, it was a ranking of the, the G20 by how much... Uh, governments spend on subsidizing or, or you know giving giving kind of state benefits to the fossil fuel industry and how much they spend on on clean energy on on the solutions to climate change and the uk is among uh, the the offenders still spending more money on making the climate crisis worse than it spends on renewables uh, but yeah on on transport the the idea that you that you give a tax break to aviation, the, the only mode of transport that doesn't pay uh, tax on its fuel. And you don't do that for buses that people rely on every day in every community to get about sustainably. Yeah, or ferries. Um, I'm just thinking of our colleague Maggie Chapman in the Northeast, who's been working and campaigning around the oil and gas and a just transition. Of course, this is this is her bailiwick because the, um, the Northeast is traditionally more dependent on oil and gas. So as someone who works in the renewable industry myself, or <laughs> up until maybe Monday, when I have to have a <laughs> conversation with my boss, <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, you know, I, I know the potential that exists in renewable energy. And I, you know, I, it's been exciting to hear Maggie talk about what the potential is there and how, you know, not we're not talking about shutting down oil and gas tomorrow. We're talking about phasing out over the next 10 years and making sure that every person who works in that industry has a jobs guarantee. So they know they've got a job to go to, they can give them support for retraining and make sure that nobody's livelihood is threatened. Knowing that we have to do this, that we have to fail out oil and gas, phase out oil and gas to meet our international obligations. Um, and, and really, I think everyone would like to work in a sustainable industry that has a long-term future. Why would anyone yeah. want to stay in a declining industry that, that has to be shut down. Yeah. No, and I, I, you know, I think we all recognize that it can be a difficult conversation to have uh, with communities where, you know, lots of people are working in, in a sector that they know in their heart is not going to be there for the long term. But I genuinely think a lot of people, even who feel vulnerable in that way, respect a bit of honesty. And, you know, Maggie uh, is, is part of the, uh, the role that we have as Greens of being honest. Uh, not just about the fact that change is coming uh, and the fossil fuel industry is not going to be around, but honest also about what we need to do now rapidly to invest in the in the sustainable jobs that will be there for the long term. So we've talked about loads of stuff during this campaign. One of the things that I was quite excited about, and I did a wee video about it, was there's some idea that we had in our manifesto about um, starting to set ourselves up on the world stage on making connections with other countries and with international organizations, for example, becoming an observer on the World Health Organization, becoming part of the Arctic Council and the Nordic Council. Now that's very exciting. And I know our candidate, Kate Nevins in Lothian region, um, she's worked around the world, particularly in the Middle East, one of her main themes is, is peace and peace building, working with women's groups to do that, but also talking about Scotland's place on the world stage. How, how as an independent country, we start to build our international relationships and start to take responsibility for our place in that. I think that's really exciting. Absolutely. And there's there's something about, you know, the this, this idea that peace, uh, peace has always been a, an important uh, aspect of who the Greens are globally, not just in Scotland, but you know, peace is is something you have to work at. 
it takes effort uh, and it takes uh, both political and, and, and diplomatic effort, but it also takes the right economic conditions uh, to, to sustain peace. And that's one of the things that the EU has, has demonstrated. It began with what are the economic conditions that would stop war in Europe uh, again. And it, it, it ended up with something that was liberating for human beings in terms of things like, like freedom of movement. But yeah, peace, peace takes work. And one of the things that Scotland could do uh, is become a, a centre for, uh, you know, conciliation and arbitration processes to, uh, to host those kind of discussions. We wouldn't even need to be independent yet in order to, to play that kind of role. Uh, and in my experience, the, uh, while a lot of intergovernmental bodies, uh, it's, it's difficult for a, a country that's not yet independent to take a seat at the table, in interparliamentary discussions, there are lots of international bodies that do welcome the Scottish Parliament and members of the Scottish Parliament to take part in those interparliamentary forums uh, on a whole host of issues from, from peace and disarmament, the, uh, the campaign for uh, you know, banning nuclear weapons, uh, through to issues around um, uh, population health, you know, things like uh, maternal health, uh, you know, um, HIV, reproductive rights, uh, all of those issues. There are interparliamentary forums, not just inter intergovernmental ones. And so Greens can play a really important role in that. Uh, and I think Scotland can play a role in that even before we, we reach the point that I know we're going to of, of becoming independent. Yeah, that is exciting stuff. I'm just going to decide. We've got some comments coming in from YouTube. William Anderson says, you've run a brilliant campaign. Well done to the whole party. I can't wait for the results. Hollywood is going green at long last. <laughs> Fingers crossed, William. William, please go out and vote tomorrow and drag everybody, everybody you know to the polling station. Absolutely. It does, it does feel like this is happening, but it's only going to happen if you get out and vote and if you persuade your friends and your neighbours to do the same. So one of my close friends among the candidates is Laura Moody in the south of Scotland. Um, so Laura Moody and I have been working behind the scenes on the Women's Network for a few years and, uh, and I know her very well and I think she's absolutely brilliant and she's standing in the south of Scotland and she's been campaigning this week for an increase in teachers. So I think that's something that many parties are looking at. We are have a manifesto, a cost of manifesto for 5,500 new teachers. We're also talking about reducing contact time scottish teachers have some of the highest contact times in europe meaning they have less time to prepare lessons less time to do the kind of professional parts of their roles that i know they would like to do so that they can adapt to their you know adapt their work to their appropriate classroom and and really kind of have that kind of professional um aspect of their job that i know that they desperately need so um what what kind of things have you been talking about on education patrick when you've been out and about yeah, I mean, one of the one of the frustrations is that um, a lot of the other parties uh, just use this as a as a stick to beat the government. And I think the I think the SNP are due criticism for um, you know a, a lot of their handling of, of education, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and a lot of teachers feel that their interests have been neglected. And obviously, a lot of young people uh, still feel very uh, bitterly aggrieved about the the mishandling of the uh, the grades fiasco. But look, there are there are things that can be done uh, with education, both for the the short, middle, and long term, to to achieve things like the closing of the attainment gap, as well as education recovery. Um, and you know, the, a lot of the other opposition parties just point the finger and say to the government, "You've been rubbish," and they don't put forward good, constructive ideas of their own for change. So things like replacing the early primary school years with a kindergarten stage. Uh, which would start earlier, it would start at three and go up to the age of six, but it would be based on on play-based learning, on the, the creative and social skills uh, that, that children need as the foundation. And then they would start formal primary school at the age of seven. Uh, or at the at the upper end, taking taking a move away from the kind of high stakes uh, uh, exam, the high stakes, high pressure kind of exam model going to continuous assessment because that's a better way of understanding actually what are what are young people learning rather than just how good are they at, at yeah, pressure yeah. exams yeah. and if you if you actually made these changes we would start to see as well as obviously the, the recruitment in the shorter term and you know there's there's something like 2000 teachers already trained who don't have permanent positions yet 
So getting getting toward that five and a half thousand new permanent places for teachers, we can make a really quick start on that because they're out there and they just need the permanent places offered to them. So these short and long term changes can actually achieve a lot of what the Scottish government says it wants to do, but it's not willing to take some of the uh, some of the big choices uh, that would help to get there. I'm quite excited, in particular, about the starting school at seven. So where I grew up, you don't start school until six. Um, which obviously it's not seven, but it's a lot older than four. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the little tiny, tiny kids go off to school. Uh, they're so tiny. So uh, part of that is just a cultural norm, I think. But yeah. I also think it recognizes that ch children, all of us, I think it's a move toward the well-being economy to recognize that we are all more than just marks on paper. We are all more than certificates. We are all more than exam results. We are humans and we need to develop all aspects, our creativity, our social skills, our physical skills, that we, we want to develop our children as whole people, not just exam, little exam factories and, and test takers. Just looking at some more of the, the comments that are coming in and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed to read them out because they're all just, you know, wonderfully excited. <laughs> That's great. And I'm, I'm really thrilled that people are feeling so positive about the campaign that we've, uh, that we've run. We've only been able to do that with your support. Uh, so if you've, if you played any role at all, uh, as I say, from, from putting up a window poster to tweeting, and I know there's loads of people tweeting uh, on the hashtag green because tonight to say why they're voting green. If you're doing that or, uh, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about adding a comment on that later, thank you so much for helping make this a really engaging campaign. Well, I can tell you about a question I had the other day that wasn't, <laughs> that was a bit more aggressive. So someone came to me on, on the question, um, on a radio show and said, why on earth are you spending 895 million pounds on restoring the natural environment? What a waste of money that is when we need teachers and we need, honestly, honestly, he was quite upset about it. But, um, but so I pointed out to him that, you know, one of the things that's very, we're talking about everywhere is creating jobs and that 895 million pounds would create at least 6,000 rural jobs in sustainable agriculture, in forestry, in, um, in, tour, in, you know, in sustainable tourism. And that's something our colleague Mark Ruskell has been talking about a lot in Mid-Scotland and Fife is the importance of rural jobs. And Laura talks about it in South as well, Laura Moody. We can't neglect the rural areas. We've seen over and over so much investment in cities and towns and the rural areas just don't get the same level of attention. And that money that we want to invest in upgrading our natural environment, restoring our natural environment, that will absolutely go directly to rural areas for those for those things that we know can help so much with the climate crisis sustainable agriculture often agriculture is, is talked about as if it's as if it's the problem instead of actually being a big part of the solution and things like yeah. reforestation um, as well so the other our other uh, lead candidate in mid scotland by mags hall she's an expert in food sustainability so of course sustainable agriculture is is absolutely her area of expertise and it is really exciting to me to bring someone who's an expert in that field to Hollywood, fingers crossed, you know, that yeah. we would we'd be able to do that because having her expertise in Parliament would be phenomenal because that would allow us to do the kind of joined up thinking that we need to not only reduce emissions from agriculture, but bring about some of our more radical policies. For example, the right to food, which had at least, I, had, I did a television gig with two Tory lords who were very upset, really upset about people having the right to food. <laughs> No doubt, no doubt they, they're very passionate about getting the subsidised restaurant in the House of Lords shut down then, if they don't have a right to food. Uh, no, I visited uh, the, a, a project called Comrie, uh, Comrie Croft with, with Mark and Mags uh, in, in their region in Mid-Scotland and Fife. And it was, it was an example of, you know, folk who've, who've managed to get access to a bit of land. Uh, it just so happens that the, the previous owner uh, was, was sympathetic to what they wanted to do. It's really, really difficult for small businesses to get started with getting access to a bit of land. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that a Scottish land fund could do is help to, to open the door a little bit to uh, whether it's, you know, small scale farmers or other kinds of, of rural businesses. And if you did this, you can, you know, you can replicate what they've what they've managed to do at Cromie with with this kind of network of, of local businesses sharing skills, sharing resources and sharing a vision. Uh, and it's being done in a way that, that is 
economically productive. It, it creates jobs and, and economic prosperity. It's ecologically productive because it's being done sustainably uh, and a lot of the land you know, is used in a, in a way that, that does support nature recovery and, and biodiversity. Um, but it's, it's socially productive as well. You know, it brings people together and creates a community around that kind of work. And so, yeah, there are, there are steps that could be taken in many, many parts of rural Scotland to do something different, do something a bit creative and allow people's own natural creativity to thrive in a way that's, that's going to create those jobs as well as the, the environmental and, and social benefit that we need. One of the most fun interviews that I did this um, campaign was with the um, small small business. I can't remember the name of the group, but it was about small businesses. And the question on the table was, "Aren't the Greens anti-business?" And the answer is <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, I work for small business, and I'm the I'm a trustee on the chair uh, on the board of a social enterprise. I'm absolutely not against small business. Oh, sorry, not against business. I'm against multinational corporations that exploit their workers, don't pay fair wages, pollute the environment, and don't don't pay fair taxes. That's what I'm against. And in, to my mind, what, one of the things we can do to help small businesses is make the big businesses play fair, make them pay <laughs> their employees properly, make them pay their fair taxes, because all the small businesses have to. If we, you know, I know there's small businesses near me that sell fruit and vegetables and stuff don't package their food in plastic. So why do we allow the big supermarkets to do that? So part of that is leveling the playing field, but something you mentioned there about the, the food and crafting reminded me about, um, so what I came back with on this question was about cooperatives and how we've given over so much of our high streets to multinational profit-making corporations that pay their workers minimum wage, which isn't even a living wage. And all the profits disappear into offshore bank accounts, into you know, mil millionaires offshore bank accounts and yachts and so on. If those businesses were cooperatives, not only would the profits go to the people who worked in them, but they could adapt the business to what their community needs and to what the workers want it to be and, and provide what the community needs instead of every high street in Scotland having the same five shops on it. We could have a lot more creativity. We could have more variety. We could you know, showcase local craft, local produce. Um, so I really want to change how we think about business. Business is not about multinational corporations. Business can be about community businesses, cooperative yeah. businesses, social enterprises, small businesses, all of which I know are run by people who care about their employees, who pay fair wages, who pay their taxes because they have to, because they can't dodge them, and who want to really build up their communities and bring something good to it. So we are yeah. not anti-business. That's the kind of business I want to see on our high streets and in our towns. In, in many ways, this is this is one of the most critical aspects of, of COVID recovery, actually, is, you know, as we start to see more of the economy emerge from the restrictions, are we simply going to get back to, to the way things were before or are we going to try and do it better? I, uh, I took part in the, the CBI hustings uh, and, uh, you know, there's so many of these hustings, these, these panel debates that, that our candidates take part in. The CBI one is perhaps not, um, uh, not the easiest gig for the Greens because you do get a lot of that, that stereotype and, the, you know, some of the audience just do want to, uh, to get back to the way things were because they were the ones benefiting from the way things were. Uh, and the first question up was, you know, okay, which of, which of you parties is, is going to be pro-business? Um, and I, I answered by saying, if, if what you want is a party that's pro-business as usual, that's not the Greens, uh, because there is an incredible opportunity to change things. And, you know, it, particularly in, in lockdown, when, when everybody's high street has been, has been empty, there, that's a horrible vision about how things could be if the Amazons of this world take over even more of our economy. Uh, and if the, if the, if the, if the multinationals uh, who whose business is to extract profit by exploiting low paid labor uh, and exploiting their customers and then siphoning all of that profit out of the country into tax havens. If those kind of business models uh, are allowed to thrive again, uh, that we, we could see you know, a, 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 real, a real decline in, in many, many communities, but it's not the way it has to be. Uh, and we can make sure that we're using our, our public spaces uh, and our, our towns and cities in a different way. Um, giving over, for example, underused or, or disused buildings uh, to the artistic community, uh, creative hubs 
uh, that allow people to find a, a cheap place to work, a cheap place to exhibit uh, or, to, or to make and create, uh, build some social space around that. And that in itself, even just that, that, that single act uh, can lift a whole area, create a buzz and a vibrancy. And then you do get small independent businesses uh, that, that thrive nearby because they can sell a few more lunches or they what it, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, if we if we think about our towns and our cities and our public space as working for the common good, uh, I think we really can reboot the economy in a way that makes it far better, fairer, and greener. And I think what you say about place making about public spaces. Is, is so crucial. I live in the center of Edinburgh and we are overrun with cars. Every street has cars parked down both sides of it. You know, as I went for a walk today and cars are coming past and you get a face full of diesel fumes with every car that comes past. And it's so unpleasant. And we've given over our cities to this noise, to this pollution, to this waste of space when we could have, we could do it differently. And we know there's data that shows that when people cycle and walk or wheel to their town centers, to their, to their local high street, they spend more money because as you say, if you've cycled all the way, you're going to pick up your shopping, but you're also maybe going to stop for a cake and have a little browse in the, in the gift shop and do all those things as well. When, you, yeah. when you're driving and parking, you just get in, get out because it's such an unpleasant experience. If we make our city and town centers and high streets pleasant places to be, people will be there. And I think that's going to be really important to reconnect with one another after this long time of being so disconnected. I mean, I can't wait to sit down in a... Well, I don't drink beer, but we can sit in a beer garden and <laughs> have a drink together. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wine person myself, but because <laughs> I, I haven't seen I have, I have been known to. Um... That's true, actually. I, re I remember. <laughs> I remember that we may have put away a bottle of wine once or twice, or or two. Um, yes, I well, I'm really doing that. And I can't wait till we can do that again. I've seen in the chat we had a. a Gentlemen, well, sorry, I don't want to agenda this person, but Andrew Castro from uh, Catalonia says, greetings from Catalonia. Many people all over the world will be watching tomorrow. So go out there and vote for a green, independent, fairer, and more sustainable Scotland. Thank you from Catalonia. Hello, Catalonia. That's, that's wonderful. I, I saw that comment as well. And I know there has been a lot of international interest in this in this election, more so than there often is in a, in a Scottish Parliament election. Uh, I think you and I were both speaking to some of the German media today. I've spoken to French media. I've spoken to Spanish. Uh, you know, there's there's been there's been a lot more of that about. What what kind of what kind of questions have you been picking up from uh, from the overseas media who've been here showing an interest? Uh, well, so as you probably know, well, as you definitely know, I uh, <laughs> work in tidal energy, but the project I was working on meant that I was in Germany for a good part of my year last year, building the powertrains for the world's largest tidal turbine, which is up in Orkney now getting installed. And I, um, so I spent a lot of time there and the Greens are a big force in Germany. So, th so what they wanted to ask me about is, well, wh what's different between the Greens in Germany and Scotland? And do you think the Greens here could be in government like they are in Germany? Because there was a sort of green wave that passed through Europe a couple mm. of years ago and, and green parties all over Europe did really well. So although, uh, I mean, there's a few different aspects of that. One is that of course, every country has its own political landscape and different green parties in different countries find themselves in different you know, playing a different role. So in Scotland, we play a very much a radical left, radically progressive, right. ra you know, radical equalities party. That that's us. We we sit in that space and we push the other parties to the left. We push them to be more fair. We push them to be longer term thinking. Um, but other parties, other green parties, don't sit in that space um, specifically, just, just depending on their landscape. So so that was quite interesting to talk about how different green parties are different and how yeah we're looking at possibly a green chancellor in Germany that could yeah. actually happen. And it, you know maybe one day we'll have a green first minister in Scotland. Well, I, I wouldn't put it past us. I mean, the the, the Germans, uh, the German Greens, who are now polling, uh, out polling the Conservatives in in some opinion polls, and later this year there is a chance that they could be the, the largest party uh, and put forward the, the the Chancellor. At the last election, they were about eight and a half percent. Now, you know, if if the Greens here in Scotland uh, are are going to poll beyond that tomorrow uh, and uh, and get a bigger group. In, in Parliament for the, the next five years, then who knows where we could be uh, when we take another step beyond that. But yeah, the the the, the level of interest in, in 
in this election has been really remarkable and i think it i think it shows that not only is is are a lot of people in scotland feeling that we're ready for scotland to take a step onto the international stage but a lot of people out there in the wider world are are ready for us to join and i think one of the things that i found really exciting about our manifesto and the way our candidates have been out there talking is that we're really presenting something transformative we're not talking about tinkering around the edges we're not talking about um, keeping things, you know, oh goodness, isn't everything awful, but we're not going to change anything, which is what I hear the message from some other parties. We are talking about transformational policies, things like a national care service, universal basic income, shutting down oil and gas in the North Sea, obviously with a just transition, but putting that line in the sand, we will no longer increase our emissions year on year. We will, we will work to bring them down. We will, you know, own up to our commitments to the Paris Agreement. These are game-changing transformational policies that, um, that I think is what people are looking for. People want to see a hopeful future and they get that you can't do that with the same old system. And I think the, the awareness as well has been particularly high. Uh, I, I know that's true in Glasgow and I think it's true throughout Scotland because of the, the, the recognition that Scotland is, is going to host the, the COP the climate summit later this year. Now there's still there's still some doubt about you know whether it'll go ahead in in the way that it would normally be expected to, and some people have even called for it to be postponed again. I think that would be the wrong decision. Uh, it will inevitably be a smaller event uh, than than the usual climate summits. Uh, a lot of the work will happen online, but I think it's going to be really important uh, to see. Uh, you know, the, the, the commitments that are needed to go beyond the Paris Agreement and get the, the Glasgow Agreement to get the world on track uh, is really urgent. It's, it's, it's not something that we can afford to put off for another year. And I think a lot of people are recognising that with, with Scotland and Glasgow having that, that responsibility of being the host country and the host city, uh, we have a, a responsibility as well and an opportunity to show uh, that the green agenda is one that's being embraced. And uh, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I'm picking up a, a lot of excitement for people who are going to get out uh, of their houses and their flats tomorrow, and they're going to go along to the polling station and they're going to they're going to put their X in the in the in the, the Scottish Green Party's uh, column in the on the peach paper. Uh, and in places like here in Kelvin, which is where the, the COP is, is going to be taking place, uh, and uh, you're standing in, in Edinburgh as well, uh, in the constituencies, the dozen or so constituencies that we're standing in in Scotland, uh, a lot of people uh, wanting to vote for, for the Greens with, with both their ballot papers. Well, and you mentioned the time critical nature of it, that, you know, COP shouldn't be delayed because of the time critical nature of the climate emergency. I mean, we have fewer than nine years left to make significant changes, to actually bring our emissions right, right down, you know, as close to zero as we can actually feasibly do so. And five of those next nine years is the term, more than half will be the next term of the next Scottish Parliament. So we really are asking people to vote like their future depends on it tomorrow, because it does. If we don't make significant transformative change to our economy, our way of life, our how we transport things around, how we transport people around, how we generate our energy. If we don't make significant changes in our five years, we are endangering our future and we are endangering the future of our kids and grandkids. So please come out tomorrow and vote like your future depends on it because it really does. Yeah, and it's also because not doing so would be to miss an opportunity to invest for the future uh, and to create prosperity and, and a healthy society that's going to be there for the long term. So yeah, the, the green the green campaign is a is a real warning about what could happen if we don't act, but it's also a positive vision about what we can create if we do take that that brave step of of acting. Uh, and uh, you know if, if people vote like our future depends on it, then we'll have a big group of, of MSPs uh, ready on day one to work like our future depends on it. Absolutely. Well, I think that positive message is such a big part of it, isn't it? Because the, the message isn't, oh, goodness, we're helpless, we can't do anything. The message is, and that's what I really liked about our manifesto, is it's really practical. Here's what we have to do. Here's how much it's going to cost. 
And at the same time, we can create 100,000 jobs. We can you know, make sure that the future is better, not worse. There's so much, and I don't know if you find there's so much negativity from the other politicians at every hustings and debate, so much criticism and debate, and very little coming to the table and going, look, here's how we solve this problem. Here's how we create 100,000 jobs. Here's how we upgrade you know, 5 million homes. Here's how, we, here's how we do all the things that need to be done. And that's, it was just plain, plain speaking, plain thinking. <laughs> Um, you know, here we go. We know what to do and, and we can definitely do it with, with more MSPs. So I think after us, to uh, chatting just now, we've got our colleagues Kim Long and Ross Greer will be live on Instagram at 10 o'clock. So in just under 15 minutes, um, you can listen to Kim and Ross. So Kim and Ross are not only exceptionally hardworking people and very cool, they are also two of our young candidates. Um, candidates are under 30. So this is something that I think is also really special about the Greens. Not only are many of our policies around young people, but our candidates are young people too. <laughs> so um, that kind of diversity of thought, that kind of making sure that young people's issues are on the table that I think really get overlooked uh, in, in politics in general is very exciting. So yeah, join Ross and Kim on Instagram in 15 minutes to find out what they've got to say. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And there's there's that sense of generational injustice as well. You know, you, you've got a an older generation that, uh, you know, a, a lot of them didn't have uh, all of the, the advantages, but many uh, did have a free higher education and got access to affordable housing uh, after it. And now you've got young people, you know, down south where they, they even have to pay uh, for, for higher education. Young people coming out with 40, 50, 60,000 pounds of debt, or more in some cases, before they've even got their first job. Uh, and housing unaffordable, uh, and wages chronically low. So if we if we want that fairer, better society, it's also got to be one with a generational justice. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think um, if you if you haven't yet had enough uh, chat uh, from from the Scottish Greens, uh, head along to the the Greens who are uh, at Scottish Green Party on Instagram, uh, and you can. You can be even more inspired by Kim and Ross. And I know people are going to be frustrated having to wait a bit longer than usual this time for the results. Uh, but if you get out there and vote uh, tomorrow, uh, you know, polls close at 10 o'clock. So you don't need to take your ID. You don't need to take your, your polling card. It can be helpful if you've, if you've got it handy. But you don't absolutely need it. Uh, and I think people are being advised to take a, a pen or a pencil with you as well uh, this time. Uh, so, you Wear know. Mask. Pen, pencil. Yeah, absolutely. Show up at the Get out there before 7, 7 a.m. and 10 at p.m. And everywhere in Scotland, uh, you can you can vote green, and you won't necessarily wake up the next morning to see the results. Uh, but by sometime on Saturday afternoon, we could be in a position of announcing that we have a green MSP for every single region in Scotland. That would be amazing. And you, every one of you watching, can help make that happen. Very good. Brilliant. Well, it's lovely to speak with you, Patrick, and I look forward to hopefully lots of phone calls and texts with you on Saturday as our candidates start coming in and we got start knocking them off and start cheering each other on. And then uh, then it's like into into work on Monday. Like, is that quick? So exciting. <laughs> uh, so exciting. Brilliant. Have a good evening, Lo Patrick. We'll see you soon. Lovely to see you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. And vote like your future depends on it. <laughs>